Good day to you. Hope you're having a wonderful day. We are reading in the Gospel of John. I'm trying to get us back on track. I've done some different things. Um, but we want to get back on track to the Gospel of John. We're ready to read chapter 7. Now, this is unscripted. This is just a like foundational type of uh, Bible study where we're reading the Bible and trying to understand the events and try to understand what is being said so that we can apply that to ourselves. Um, this is not like an exhaustive concordance searching type of Bible study, okay? So just <laughs> just want to make that clear and, you know, it's unscripted. I'm just reading and discussing things as we go. So, all right. So again, this is the Gospel of John, chapter 7, verse 1. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea, because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews' Feast of Booths was at hand. They were having what they call the Feast of Booths, where they live outdoors in these booths, or kind of like tents made of tree branches. You could think of it almost as like lean-tos in a way. I guess. It's also called, did they say here? Uh, it's also called the Feast of Tabernacles in some translations. So, um, and this was a, this was a big celebration for them. This was something they really liked. I, I don't understand it, but, you know, I, I, I don't have to. It's just something they did. This was one of their, um, what would you call it? I guess kind of a holiday or, um, celebrations. So his brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers believed in him. Now his brothers here... Um, now I was reading in the Amplified Bible, and it says it is actually his younger brothers, Jude and James... And that they, uh, you know, they have their own epistles in the New Testament. They, of course, are Joseph's sons and Mary's sons. But, you know, so they're brothers to, to Jesus, but they are not. Um, I guess you would say they were technically half-brothers or, you know. But nonetheless, they were brothers. They grew up together. Um, so they're recommending that Jesus go, you know, hey, go go into town show yourself do these things don't uh you know you if if you're going to do these things you know you don't want to do these in secret you want to show it you want everybody to see it and jesus said to them my time has not yet come but your time is always here the world cannot hate you but it hates me because i testify about it that its works are evil you go up to the feast i am not going up to this feast for my time has not yet fully come after saying this, he remained in Galilee. So he sent them on up to the feast. This is, I don't know how long this celebration lasts or anything. So, um, it sounds like it lasted for days. I have, I have read this chapter a few times because there's things here that were, are definitely worth studying and looking at. <clears throat> okay, so, um, verse 10, But after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up, not publicly, but in private. Now, the way that the amp I've been studying some of the Amplified Bible, too, using it to help kind of fill some things out for me and help me to understand some things. Um, let's see, where was I? So... And it was saying he went up to the feast, you know, not publicly, but in private. And the way it says that is not with a caravan, not with a... See, he went up alone as just a single person. He just went up and came in without having, you know, a, a group of people with him that draws attention. He didn't have a crowd with him. Yes. So see the difference? He, he came up here privately as just a person and, and nobody, you know... Uh, that way he could kind of slip in. You know, he could just come in without being attracting attention. So the Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, Where is he? And there was much muttering about him among the people. While some said, He is a good man. Others said, No, he is leading the people astray. 
Yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. Now when they're talking about the Jews here, they're referring to the leader of the Jews, the leaders of the Jews. Okay. So I, I'm not sure why this comes about this way um, in this in this gospel, but uh, they're talking about the leaders of the Jews. All right. So yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. Verse 14. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. Now, see, I don't know if this is like a week-long thing or two weeks long. I, I don't know if it's, you know, how many days it is. Um, the Jews, therefore, marveled, saying, How is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? He doesn't have their formal... He, To them, he doesn't have their formal background. He shouldn't know what he knows. He shouldn't, you know be able to teach like this because he doesn't have that formal training that would come from them. So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but it, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. But the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true and in him there is no falsehood. Now Jesus is referring to the fact that he is speaking not on his own authority, but he is speaking, because he's not seeking his own glory, but he's speaking of God on God's authority, and he's seeking God's glory, not his own. Verse 19, Has not Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? Now, this is true in a couple of ways. Has not Moses given you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? They don't really, they don't really keep the law as it was intended. And, and the Gospels are all about, I mean, there's a lot about uh, Jesus speaking to the, the leaders and uh, explaining to them how they're wrong and how they're doing wrong things and they're not following the law as it was intended to be um, and then why do you seek to kill me I mean that's an obvious <laughs> that's an obvious thing that's against the law they seek to kill him but uh, also they you know they're seeking to kill him because they feel he's a threat to them maybe you know maybe they're well we won't get into all the human motives there but nonetheless um, the crowd answered you have a demon who is seeking to kill you Jesus answered them, I did one deed, and you all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that is from Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Now here, Jesus is plainly saying, See, when they get circumcised, they have to be circumcised on the eighth day. If I remember correctly, it's the eighth day. And that actually turns out to be a really excellent day to circumcise a child. Um, medically speaking, uh, as babies, they just have... Uh, they have a real uh, resistance to any problems or issues. Um, I'm trying to think of the right word. Uh, anyway, they're just... You can read about it. Um, I, I have read it, but I don't remember all the exact stuff. And I'm not a medical person, so just pardon me there. But um, the baby has a lot of good, uh, like, antibody things and, and defenses, you know, at that on that eighth day. Uh, that, that starts to subside after that. It's like their body builds up all this stuff. Anyway, so the eighth day is a great day to be circumcised. It is the best day, and um, because they must be uh, circumcised on the eighth day, sometimes if it's on a Sabbath, they still do it. Okay, and now, um, so if it's okay to, and that's that would be an example of something that has to be done at a certain time, and if it falls on a Sabbath, or 
in our case, let's just think of it as it falls on the Lord's Day on Sunday, and it needs to be done, you're still going to have to do that. And you, you, you do that and you take care of it. <clears throat> now here Jesus had healed someone, and he's referring back to where he had healed. Um, and this had, this had occurred uh, in a previous chapter that he had healed someone on the Sabbath. And they were, you know, they were not happy with him, and they uh, were plotting to kill him because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. Um, and he's just saying to them, why is it okay to circumcise a baby on the Sabbath, you know, to fulfill the law, but it's not okay to heal someone? And he, he just says their judgment is wrong. Their, their hearts are in the wrong place. They're not thinking about these things clearly. It should always be okay to heal someone. I mean, what if the person was grievously injured would it not be okay to try to patch them up and keep them alive I mean you know of course it would be so anyway they he knows they are plotting to kill him too so so this is just another example of him talking to the leaders and saying look you know there's nothing wrong with this so verse 25 some of the people of Jerusalem therefore said is not this the man whom they seek to kill and here he is speaking openly, and they say nothing to him. Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Christ? But we know where this man comes from, and when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. So Jesus proclaimed as he taught in the temple, You know me, and you know where I come from. But I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true, and him you do not know. I know him, for I come from him, and he sent me. So they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. Yet many of the people believed in him. They said, When the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? As I've, I've stated before, Jesus just did so many miracles. He did so many things in his ministry. He healed people and did so much that... Uh, he was just really, really famous for it. And uh, you'll see here, when Jesus is referring to, um, you know, you know where I come from, but you don't know who sent me. You know, he's talking about God, of course. He's saying, you know, God sent me, and you do not truly know God. Um, but I know him because I came from him. And, and he's referring to God. So here the Jews, so they were seeking to arrest him. The Jews were wanting to arrest him um, because he's making himself again equal to God, saying he came from God. And, um, well, in their minds, you know, making making himself equal to, to God and, and basically saying he is the Christ. And the people are believing in him and saying, well, you know, is the Christ, is the Christ going to do more than this guy has done? I mean, because Jesus was fulfilling uh, those prophecies. Verse 32, the Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him, and the chief priests and Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. Pardon me. <clears throat> Jesus then said, I will be with you a little longer, and then I am going to him who sent me. You will seek me, and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What does he mean by saying, You will seek me, and you will not find me? Where I am, you cannot come. They were not understanding that he... He knew what he was going to do. He knew he was going to die and be resurrected and go to heaven and be our mediator, you know, in heaven with God. He knew how things were going to change. He knew what his mission was and what he was doing. So they did not understand. And, you know, they're talking about does he in intend to go into the dispersion among the Greeks when the... Uh, when Israel, when the nation of Israel, the ten tribes were 
taken into I think it's Assyrian captivity and they never really came out of that they never really returned um, those those folks um, they were basically dispersed they ended up just being dispersed into um, well they say the Greeks I think a lot of times they said the Greeks when they meant Gentiles those folks ended up living on and being dispersed into the rest of the nations of the world over time now immediately that would have been Assyria and maybe the neighbors the neighboring countries around Assyria but Assyria itself was um, uh, what's, what's the right word conquered at some point so you know they ended up being dispersed out into the Gentile world okay the Gentile nations and over time you know they've spread around and I mean I don't know that uh, I think there are supposedly still some folks from those tribes um, that are you know they are Jewish they adhere to the Jewish way of life and all but I'm not I'm not up on all that so I do know that this dispersion among the Greeks refers to or at least from what I've read and what I understand refers to those Jews who did not who really did not come back from that captivity those people were captured taken to Assyria and ended up just being dispersed out like I say into the Gentiles over you know over hundreds of years their their, their families and their um, descendants you know just ended up being spread out through the world through the Gentile world so um if I'm wrong about that, you can always let me know, but that from my reading and from my understanding, that's that's what that was about. So they wondered if they were going to be part of those Jews that were spread out through the rest of the world, if he was going out to speak to them. Uh, verse 37, On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Right, the Spirit would not be given until after Jesus died and rose again. And we, we will, Lord willing, we will read about that. Um, now, verse 40, When they heard these words, some of the people said, This really is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Is this... No. Let me rephrase that. But some said, Is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So there was a division among the people over him. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees, who said to them, Why did you not bring him? The officers answered, No one ever spoke like this man. The Pharisees answered them, Have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, who had gone to him before and who was one of them, said to them, does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. So they're referring to the scriptures where no prophet comes from Galilee. It is, it is stated. Let me see. Do I have that reference? Um, I do not have that reference right here. But nonetheless, there is scripture that says that you know, no prophet will come from Galilee. But what they didn't understand was Jesus Jesus' story. He had been born in Bethlehem and you know so that he was he was actually the Christ. They just didn't know that. So you notice the people were some really did believe. Some believed that he was a prophet, some believed that he was the Messiah. But they were expecting him to come from Bethlehem. 
And let's see. So, uh, and you notice Nicodemus here is kind of. I think Nicodemus was trying to interject some logical thinking, some sound thinking. Hey, do, do we not follow our own law? Do we not, you know, first give a man a hearing and see what's going on before we judge him and try to arrest him and condemn him? You know, and then they, see, they kind of came at him. Are you from Galilee too? Like, we'll just take you and throw you in jail and get rid of you too. You know, but it's a little threatening that's all I'm getting at but then they say search you know the scriptures and you will see that no prophet comes from Galilee so they were definitely the leaders were definitely wanting to uh, get rid of Jesus because the people were starting to believe in him and if they did believe in him then they served no purpose anymore when the Messiah would come I don't I don't know what these chief priests and everybody thought but when the Messiah would come uh, they would not be needed at least in the role they had had all this time they would not they would not have that power they would not have that influence instead they would be actually subject to the Messiah which they should have been they should have recognized him as the Christ as the Messiah and should have been subject to him but they were not willing to give up their position and their power. And they were not willing to listen to reason. So, alright. That is the end of chapter 7. I want to thank you for listening. Hope you have a wonderful day. And God bless you.